um, Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome curator, the innovation hangar, Dan Shine. Good morning, how are you? Uh, thank you so much for being here, especially very early on the last day of uh, this great conference. Um, you all get bonus points and you'll find a prize underneath your seat if you look for it. Um, there's at least one prize. Nobody's even trying. Okay. All right, well in any case, good morning. Um, for those of you that are here, uh, I, I hope that the idea of the importance of ICT uh, as it relates to the future of Africa is as important to you as it is to all of the people on our distinguished panel. Um, I would say distinguished, but also uh, uh, hardened and weathered and worn because there have been so many tries and failures uh, with regard to the deployment of ICT. There's been so much confusion about what the importance of us ICT is and why it matters so much uh, to us now and how things have dramatically changed over the last 10 years. So over the next impossible 45 or so minutes, uh, we will try to uh, address the question of what has come before, what has failed, uh, and what are the hopes for the future uh, from people that have truly had the experience of being uh, a distinct part of it. So very briefly, I'll, I'll, I'll do introductions. Uh, just to my left is Sophia Beckle, uh, who is the CEO of CBS International USA. Uh, but very importantly, she has had many hats, and she's also the executive director of the DCA Trust and the founder of the Yes to Data Africa campaign. Uh, just to her left is Mac Jordan uh, de Gredour. I'm sure I got that wrong. Yeah. Uh, Co-founder of Africa New Media and Internet Freedom Fellow. Um, just to his left, if I... If, uh, settings is still correct, is Armand, and uh, Armand is the Director General of the uh, Economie Numérique of Gabon, and uh, uh, the, the presentation that you just saw on the screen was uh, from his division. Uh, just to his left is someone that I think I know from maybe almost 10 years ago, but I have to be sure, uh, but is Joseph Ogotu, who is the Strategy and Innovation Director for Safaricom, and I think the word innovation is especially important in, in that context. Uh, and just to his uh, left is Ya Awosu, who's the managing director of the Ghana Cyber City of Ghana, somebody who's intimately involved in sort of the next phase of what will happen with regard to ICT. So thank you all for being here. Uh, and uh, I think our intention uh, is to sort of get into uh, where we are now and what has changed and to try to keep it as a lively conversation, which I think will be especially important for our audience. Um, and uh, I will um, try to keep my remarks brief. The one thing that came to my mind as I thought about this session was a conversation that I had with a man named Jim Wolfenson. And for those that don't know, Jim Wolfenson was uh, a very highly regarded uh, uh, member, or excuse me, leader of the World Bank. And when I was doing uh, ICT implementation uh, last uh, 10 years ago, we talked about what was to come. And his comment, frankly, was, if you give people that are living on $3 a day internet access and come back in two years, you will have a lot of people living on $3 a day that know a lot of things. His point was that unless you come up with a comprehensive solution, unless you have a purpose and unless you have an idea of where you want things to be and what you want people to achieve through ICT. And unless you dedicate and, and develop your solutions very specifically for a purpose, you won't get very far. In 2004, uh, I was involved in the first ICT uh, deployment in uh, the, my organization did at the time in Deep Sleep in Johannesburg. And we came around to the point of the conversation where we said, uh, well, as we put out these computers for children in this, in this school, uh, where will we put them? And their eyes lit up. They said, ah, no problem. And the principal, the head of school, uh, Veronica Quambo, uh, asked uh, uh, someone else who asked someone else, and they had a key. And with the key, they took me to a room, and they unlocked the room. And inside the room 
was a set of dusty computers that were not maintained, that were stacked up on the floor, that were largely open, uh, not contained. And the message was, we've tried this before. We've tried to, you know, bringing ICT to our students before, and because it wasn't a comprehensive solution, it didn't make it. So what I'd like to discuss today uh, and, and uh, make available for conversation uh, is the idea of what's happened in the last 10 years, what can we do differently, uh, and what are the biggest examples that you can provide of where ICTs have made a substantial change, uh, almost such an extraordinary change that the imperative to continue is so very strong. So uh, with that, um, I, I think I would like to, because I've, I, I have some experience with Joseph and because I think um, there is such a strong history, or excuse me, strong importance as we all know from all the people that are holding up their smartphones taking pictures right now, that mobile is extremely important. And 10 years ago, we did not have the mobile opportunities that we have today. Uh, 10 years ago, penetration of internet access in Africa was 1%. Uh, the world population was 9%. So, Joseph, what is the most exciting development or trend that you're seeing with regard to uptake? We've talked about, uh, you know, the fact that there's going to be half a billion smartphones, but that really doesn't mean too much unless we really talk about how that's changing people's lives. Yes. Um, over the last 10 years, uh, as you've rightly pointed out, I think mobile, penetra mobile penetration has really grown. Um, um, you know, depending on which figures you look look at, you are doing at about 600 to 700, uh, 600 million to 700 million uh, mobile phones that are now available in Africa. So the fastest growth of mobile phone penetration is actually happening here in Africa. Now, um, what has changed significantly? Because it's not just about having the mobile phone, but what the mobile phone can do for you. And I want to argue here that uh, we are developing what we call a connected society. Why is it a connected society? It's a connected society because with a mobile phone, people can do communicate. But secondly, we are having data-enabled phones. So people are having their first internet experience using the mobile phone. In my country, for instance, uh, we are doing about 10,000 new people every day having the internet experience on their mobile phone. And I think that is significant. In addition to that, um, because they now, we now have value added on top of the mobile phone, we now have uh, mobile payments available on the mobile phones, and that is making a huge difference in people's life. In my country, we launched the M-Pesa in 2007. Today, seven years after that, out of a uh, subscriber base of 21 million, 19 million are registered on M-Pesa. So it means, therefore, that even though they may not have bank accounts, the mobile phone is enabling them to be connected to the financial system. They are able to transact without ever going to a bank. They are able to register, to have an account to be able to save, to be able to borrow using their mobile phone. The mobile phone now has allowed uh, businesses, for instance, to be able to pay their workers using the mobile phone. Today, with the mobile phone, a farmer is able to get information about prices in the market that they're obtaining in the day using uh, the mobile phone. So um, if I may just close by saying that uh, the mobile phone is not just a communication tool, but it has allowed us to be a connected society. Think of a connected worker. Think of a connected student. Think of a connected farmer. This has a huge potential in terms of transforming lives. Let me just leave it there. Thank you. And I think. Uh, the point is excellent with regard to the, the importance of access to uh, the financial system as, as being one of the most important things. Um, 
Armand, um, how have things changed uh, with regard to the priority within government and with regard to, especially as we talk about financial systems, as you adapt to these changes, are there concerns that a secondary financial system threatens uh, traditional financial systems, or is there an ability to embrace financial systems and to try to move with uh, the advent of mobile financial technologies uh, as opposed to worrying more about regulations uh, for those in areas? Okay, no en place. We are, in fact, setting up uh, a regulatory framework, which is quite solid and uh, which can uh, accept all these different services and uh, the laws in terms of uh, information and uh, have been uh, applied and are being examined uh, at the level of the parliament. But I would like to uh, complete what my colleague was saying concerning mobile services because today in the health sector, we've had a, a great deal of uh, significant evolution of the SMET form. In other words, we have a, like an intelligence stethoscope uh, from which we can uh, simply uh, look into the chest of someone by placing something on the chest and we can get all the different information from that person's health and send it to a, a central data center so that the um, doctor, whether he's in the major city or, or in another village or city, he can actually collect all that information concerning the person's health and give him a, a prescription for his health. We also have an innovative project uh, called Gabon uh, Numeric or Digital Village and uh, we use this in the different rural villages. It's called an MF, it's got an educational system, in which it also permits uh, the uh, local populations to have uh, electricity through a solar uh, energy system. We also have a cloud system, which allows uh, for the rural populations uh, to be able to uh, learn the different vernacular languages and also to receive uh, in the local languages different uh, information which is sent to them digitally. educational systems, a follow-on question. Uh, what is the target age group that you're focused on to provide these tools and this education? Does it, is, it, is it the earliest learners or is it uh, people that are ready to move on to vocational roles following, uh, following high school or, or, or advanced school? A lot. Well, everything is included in this uh, very big program. We have the youngest uh, who are uh, included in the digital uh, programs. And then also in the major cities, we have an educational program. And then of course in the uh, rural areas, we have another program called M Education. And uh, concerning the older people who are already included in professional uh, systems, we've developed uh, uh, different learning programs and of course, we also have incubators. These are called startups and small and medium sized businesses in order to uh, create uh, different uh, uh, relationships between the university and small businesses. And uh, we're hoping to encourage those small businesses through that program. Uh, perhaps to Yaw, uh, who has been uh, very involved in, in sort of the, uh, the advancement uh, of programs uh, related to innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, how are things going in Ghana? And, and as you describe what's happening, what are the uh, opportunities for scale? Um, uh, and you know, we talked earlier about the notion of contiguous countries and what the next country over is doing. How do we break through that and get to the point where things that are being done in one place that are best practices can spread more rapidly? Okay, sure. Okay, um, uh, let me continue from where uh, Joseph left off with respect to uh, how Africans are using innovation to change uh, lives you know, from the grassroots. According to researchers, up to as many as 30% uh, of all drugs sold in the market in Africa are counterfeit or fake. And um, M-pedigree, which many of you have read about, I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, came up with an, uh, a very simple innovation that, um, that is helping to weed out this
proliferation of counterfeit medication in Africa in partnership with Hewlett Packard. And according to, according to studies, as many as 700,000 lives can, can potentially be saved with this innovation. And this is how it works. So let's say a customer goes to a pharmacy or any place you know, that, uh, to buy medication in order for the customer to identify whether it's um, real medication or counterfeit, uh, he or she will simply text uh, a serial number to a code. And, that, and he, he or she would immediately get a feedback um, whether you know, that medication is fake or not. Um, again, uh, this is uh, pioneered by M Pedigree, um, founded by Bright Simmons uh, in Ghana, in uh, and uh, Hilary Packard recently partnered with, partnered with um, M Pedigree. And um, big pharmaceutical companies are now signing up all over the world. Uh, so this is being um, employed, uh, deployed in Africa, in dozens of countries in Africa, India, and other markets in Asia, and also in, in La Latin America. Okay, uh, case study two. Um, uh, Joseph mentioned how um, uh, application of mobile uh, technology uh, in, in, in um, deploying uh, market information for, for in agribusiness. Um, the best case study on that is ESOCO. ESOCO was also pioneered in Ghana, and um, the International Finance Corporation uh, recently invested heavily in, in, that, um, in that innovation. And it's also fairly simple. What that does is uh, it basically creates a mobile marketplace where suppliers or farmers, you know, wherever they are you know, in Africa, can post their you know, can post their products and sell their products that they are trying to sell to the um, international market. And buyers can also access the same, you know, mobile application. And it's a fairly simple, fairly simple innovation that um, farmers with limited access to education in rural parts of Africa are now, you know, trained to basically um, source, you know, inform bias information as well as, you know, post their uh, agribusiness uh, data as well. And that is really changing because in Africa, as many of you know, um, a very high percentage, more than 20% of um, agricultural products never actually get to the market at all for, for a variety of reasons, for lack of infrastructure and also for lack of access to uh, buyers. I think the, the, one, the one question I would have back, and it, and it goes both to, to, to your comment uh, as well as those of Armand, um, how many people in the, in the audience have heard that one of the greatest uh, um, triumphs of ICT and mobile ICT is by allowing farmers to have access to important information? Who has heard that, that's, that that has existed? Really? Not, not that many. Okay. It's something that I've heard many times. And while I think that there are many different advantages of, of, that, that ICT has brought, I have yet to really actually meet a, a group of farmers uh, that has truly benefited in, in that way as to knowing crop prices. I, I will say that they've learned things with regard to uh, uh, pollutants, they've learned things with regard to uh, infestations and things like that, but I, I have yet to find that they've, that they've learned the crop prices, so I, so I would like to learn that. Uh, at some point, and I'd like to meet those people. Um, let me uh, go next to Mac, um, uh, who ostensibly, I, I think, may be one of our youngest panelists uh, and most in tuned. Um, how many people in the last three days have sent a tweet in the audience? Seven. Seven of you. Congratulations. Mac is definitely one of the most prolific people uh, on social media that I've seen at this conference. Um, how is that changing things? And how, how, how has the spirit changed with regard to uh, people being in more constant contact? One of the arguments you could make is that the importance of ICT is not the bandwidth, but is the persistence of the connection. 
the ability of being connected, and maybe you could speak to that. Um, th thank you so much for that compliment. Um, so I come from an area where young people are striving day in, day out to, um, to change the way society see um, young people. I mean, young people like myself are changing the game where we are creating jobs for ourselves using today's modern technology and more. I mean, go across the continent from east to west, let's say from Accra to Lagos to Nairobi to um, Dar es Salaam, Young people are working in hubs where they are being mentored by professionals from different corporations to develop the next application game changers. These are not just applications for making money, the application being developed to solve local problems. I mean, a lot have been said about farming, about health, about even mobile payment and all of that. But let's come back to, to our own local setting. How, is, how, are we, how are we using internet? How are we using the infrastructure we have? Are we improving upon those infrastructures we have? I'm not sure we are doing that. I mean, in Ghana, for instance, we have a high mobile penetration, which is about 100 plus percent. That is mobile penetration. Uh, mobile internet is below 50%, right? But broadband penetration is below 20%. Women are not being factored into all of these considerations. I mean, a, a lot of talk goes on and on, and I feel sad because the conversation is not driven around everybody. It's just driven around, around male. I mean, tech, tech is very dominated by male, but it is about time we, we focus on bringing women on board so that they can also learn from that whole aspect. We have fashion designers among us who want to use technology to promote their goods. Are they left behind? Social media is, is opening a lot of opportunity for young people out there. It's about time governments meet with young people to actually assimilate how technology can improve upon their lives and also change the game of, uh, from unemployment to they becoming self-employed. That is my opinion. Important. I'm, glad, I'm very glad you brought up the issue of gender uh, and gender equity because I, I think it is, uh, it's one of the promises of, of uh, the impl you know, implementation of ICT. There's been many discussions that, uh, that, the, that the best uptake of ICT has often been by, by women in communities. Um, I've seen it happen sometimes, but, uh, but not always. But I, but I think there is no question that the future, uh, the, you know, as, as some different programs have, have suggested, you know, the future is in the hand of a girl uh, at this point. So the question is how we, how we increase that, and maybe we could, we could talk about that a little bit more. Um, I want to turn it over now to Sophia, uh, uh, who, along with y'all, and, and in fact, a number of you, but has had um, probably one of the most important things that you can have in this, in this, uh, in this space uh, is, the, uh, is the notion of perspective. The fact that you've had the chance to to be in in other environments and to and to run other organizations and to hear hear the the thoughts and and uh, views of, of people from a business standpoint with regard to the the, the, the future and the priority, um, but also a great passion for for making things happen uh, in the in in the continent. So maybe you'd like to talk about that a little bit. Thank you, Dan. Um, first, let me uh, say thank you for that uh, great introduction at the beginning on the status of ICT in Africa. And I would like to thank you for bringing the issue of gender, which is very dear to me. And um, uh, something I could um, say a few things about. Um, I've been in the technology business for nearly a couple of decades and um, started, I'm a diaspora African. I've come back to the continent and I've watched the ICT sector in the, from the 90s to the 2000s grow very, very rapidly with the implementation of fiber optics. And um, I remember the 2007 uh, ITU summit, which brought the heads of state in Kigali, that really empowered the, the leadership of Africa to look at the value of technology for uh, its societies, because we, um, coming from the US where, um, most of the infrastructure has already been built and, and then coming back to Africa, like some of my colleagues here, and seeing that everybody's struggling and understanding the value of ICT, but there's no policy process in place to adapt, to do anything about it, was such a frustration journey for all of us uh, returnees. But right now, after 2007, there has been an extremely huge adoption by leadership 
to move forward. So the next step after that, uh, between, after 2007, what really happened with all these fiber optic implementation, west, east, north, and south, uh, people didn't know what to do with, um, with uh, what else can we do with the fiber implementation. So the, the three key things that I would like to uh, share and, and take away from this forum is innovation and profitability. So first we have to innovate and how do we turn that into profit so that people would benefit? Uh, how do we monetize the infrastructure? So there could be more entrepreneurship uh, and, and that's one of the key. And so a lot has not been done in the rural areas, for example. There, some countries are adapting a rural development strategy to include those that are using mobile because fiber does not reach the rural area. So most 90% of African societies have now adapted to the mobile use. And so, like my colleague Joe has said, a lot of innovation has started with Safaricom, which is being adapted all over. But there is that innovation. But how do you turn it into a profitable enterprise for young entrepreneurs and any other entrepreneur to want to see the internet as a vehicle to actually assist them to improve their lives. So ruler development strategy has to be implemented as part of the national policies and um, other, um, other areas also, um, like you mentioned, Dan, are the applications that are being built. Aside from M-Pesa, there is the iCow, which is uh, a very popular service for farmers to actually look at statistics, even register individual cows, and have a database of uh, the historic, um, uh, the historic, uh, uh, how do you say, the, uh, the history of the cow yes. and in its health, and, and uh, directly connecting with the, with the cow doctors. I don't know what you call them. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> the veterinarians. Yeah, yeah, yeah veterinarians, okay. thank you. So that application is there, and PESA is there. Um, and so these are very, very critical uh, uh, mobile applications that, would, uh, that we use. And the youth are the ones that actually are generating this uh, based on a need uh, basis. The youth are the ones who have time to get engaged in developing technology. And so here we are, innovation and profitability. And they have to see the profit motive for, uh, for, uh, to utilize it. And then the other um, uh, thing I want to say is opportunities and job opportunities for um, the, the internet has to create, or the ICT has to create the, uh, job opportunities uh, for people. How do we do that? It starts again from the national level, PPP, private-public partnership. There has to be gender mainstreaming uh, for women to be part of the program at the national level. Uh, governments have to actually have a policy of integration. Private sector need to have in its employment, have a policy of integration. Entrepreneurship, that's how it starts. So um, that's uh, one area. And then the incubators are become a, such a, a place of uh, giving opportunities for, for people in ICT. There has to be a, a, a self-running incubators where we would have, um, uh, obviously, uh, vast services, its own value-added services where people could be able to uh, come and say, I think I, I, you mentioned earlier, uh, the IHUB, it has a various degree of membership, the gold, the silver, and so forth, which is obviously a subscription, uh, but they give value by actually giving, um, yeah. So those kind of things need to create so people can see the value of ICT. And finally, I talk about governance. Um, we talk about uh, governments, governance in the uh, sector of government, where uh, they have to think of the um, pricing uh, import taxes uh, on computers, they have to reduce, they have to facilitate investments, uh, they have to reduce bureaucracies and, and uh, backlogs in how they um, prioritize ICT, ICT sector for investors to come in. So these are the three areas that I, I thought I would uh, share with the... Thank you so much, Sophia, and I think, I think each one of those would, would, would merit uh, at least a task force discussion, um, and they're all very important, um, and I've got some favorites. I saw Armand actually nodding uh, with regard to the issue of governance. So I would like to touch on that, but then I definitely want to come back to 
uh, the issue of, of, of entrepreneurship and young people. So I, I will come back to that in a second. But Armand, just very briefly, um, you know, I, I talked with, uh, I've had an ongoing discourse with uh, uh, Hamadoun Touré uh, with the International Telecommunications Union um, about the notion of making internet access a basic human right. Um, how does that notion fit with with your planning, your, your aspirations for, for the country, um, and how does that relate to, to the challenge of governance if you, if you want to institute that as quickly as possible, but still do it in a way that, <clears throat> that, that uh, is managed? Yes, uh, thank you, Dan. I'm first of all going to complete with what uh, Sophia was saying concerning uh, business uh, development and uh, some of the initiatives we've taken in that area. And uh, also you saw a video film concerning uh, the uh, digital economy in Central Africa, the cyber, cyber city, which is gonna be one of the biggest in uh, Central Africa. And uh, where we're going to bring in the sub-regional integration because uh, it's gonna include not just Gabon, but the entire sub-region of uh, Central Africa. And so the question that uh, you have brought up uh, uh, concerning uh, the uh, digital economy. We are following the uh, recommendations of the telecommunications uh, union, and uh, we want to, uh, we're printing up cards that can be used, and at the level of the cyber city, I would like to talk about uh, something which is quite important, and, uh, and come back to what Sophia was saying. We're going to have a different uh, international groups that are gonna have exemption rights in terms of uh, taxes and also uh, customs uh, duties. Um, through these cards. We're also gonna be bringing in, in different international groups which are going to create different factories for the fabrication of uh, tablets and computers and smartphones and at a but much lower cost. And so we're gonna be able to uh, lower the cost of all uh, customs duties so that the uh, entire Japanese population and in the sub-region will be able to have uh, those uh, that technology at a much uh, lower price. And then within a configuration, which is gonna be quite real in terms of reducing the bill for using uh, digital services, uh, we're going to be able to make uh, that uh, access uh, quite uh, uh, generalized uh, to the entire population. So this is the policy we're following right now. And the video you saw at the beginning of this presentation is very clear. Gabon is already advancing in this area, and we're going to uh, continue and set up this uh, project in the next five or six years. To one of the Sophia's other points, um, 10 years ago, some of the greatest entrepreneurial ideas that were coming out were ways to overcome the question of access, the, the ability of getting the last mile, being, being able to deliver content and, and, and uh, capabilities to people that were uh, in rural areas. Um, I had the opportunity to talk with Richard this morning, and hopefully many of you uh, were here yesterday to hear about the announcement of the African Entrepreneurial Award that will begin next year, which I think is so important, um, uh, along with, between, between Richard's organization and, and La Pointe. Um, if you think about then what, what a year from now, what, what uh, African entrepreneurs will present to be a part of that, of that context, uh, contest, I think it will be less about uh, making it to the last mile, and it'll be more about the idea of, of what innovative things can truly be, uh, provide value uh, in this space. Along those lines, I'd like to open it up to the group um, because I'd like to discuss the changing of our generations, that the, the, the young learners that are, that are right now between the ages of maybe even 10 and 14 um, have a very different notion of what their expectation of access will be to the internet. And this goes to what we described about the ITU, but it goes more to what they would do with it if they had it and their role and responsibility in terms of being iterative, adding to the value of it, both for Africa and for the world. So um, with that comment, I, I'd like to hear from you in terms of what you, what you see, uh, perhaps optimistically or pessimistically, as to what you think young people will propose and what will be the most important centers for that proposal uh, in that area. I open up to everyone, uh, Mac Jordan. Okay, um, 
I'm going to take it from a point of view where we need more investor-driven communities around Africa where um, people from, I mean, countries in Africa um, who have the potential to invest in young people should be able to um, do that. Because what, what I see happening across, across the, the region is where young people are able to build community, I mean, build startups, but they don't have the funding to push to the next level. So they, they then go ahead to um, seek funding from international organizations and more. Meanwhile, there are people within their own communities that can invest into them and help them develop that application to the next level. So what we, what, what we are facing in Africa currently is lack of VC networks. So if you are able to have, let's say, a VC network in East Africa, focus on the East African community, a VC network in West Africa, focus on the West African community, and even in Central Africa I mean, community, it will push young people to like, oh, go, I have an idea. Let me work on this idea and probably pitch to a VT, VC to see what will be the outcome. Aside even the VC, we should, we should buy into the whole idea of incubators. Um, I was happy when I heard that there, there's an agreement signed for, with Gabon to have an SME incubator for, to promote entrepreneurship in Gabon. It's a good idea. This, uh, this idea should be replicated across the country, I mean, across the, the, the continent where wherever you go, you, you'll be happy to see young people working and using ICT to develop the next tools that will change the game. I mean, take for instance, they said there's an application developed in Ghana called Empower. Um, a lot of people seem to forget about the, uh, the blue-collar job seekers, the painters, the, the cleaners, and all of that. These people need jobs. I mean, when you go to the major cities, you see posters about, if you need a painter, call me. Somebody's been able to develop an application that runs on a mobile, I mean, a normal um, feature phone that makes you register to be part of the network. If somebody need a painter, that person could just call you up and um, offer you a job, and right there you have a job. This application is being replicated in Kenya, in Tanzania, and in South Africa, and it is working. I'm pretty sure if something is developed here in, in, in Gabon, it will be used by all, and uh, it will go a long way. So let's focus on the VC. Let's let our own people support our own ideas. We shouldn't wait for NGOs or international donors to come support ideas being developed locally. Thank you. Okay, let, let me so I do want to, yeah, I'm going to actually get you, get, right. give you that chance in just one second. So I, I do want to get actually the questions from the audience in a minute, but what I was actually, I was going to direct to you just now okay. in terms of what you think, and you can answer this as part of your yeah, question, yeah. and yeah. let's keep it short so we can get to other questions. But what, what, is, what is the most exciting thing that has made you sit back in your seat with regard to ITT and the entrepreneurs that you see coming through? coming through Ghana and the incubators, what's the, what's the one thing that you've looked at that said, oh my gosh, this is a game changer? Um, we rephrase the question. One thing, the most exciting what, thing that's What's the most exciting thing that you've seen from an entrepreneur in the last year that has made you think, this will be successful, this is going to change lives? Be very exciting. Oh, okay. Uh, that's pretty easy. The, the, the development, the upcoming development of the Ghana Cyber City is sitting right next to the University of Ghana, which has a population of uh, 30,000. Um, what I, we have talked about um, incubation. So incubation is going to be the biggest focus of this um, in, um, venture. The, the project in Gabon is situated on an island, but we are bringing it to the people. It's right next to the, where the students you know, need incubation facilities. So, but I, I get it. So I, I, I get the idea that the incubation is important. But so far, if you had to explain to somebody why incubation is important and could give them one example of someone that's come through, what, what's the solution? What's the, what, what, has, what is the service or product that one person has made that's blown you away? Oh, OK. Actually, there are many, you know, not, not just one. There is, I've talked about uh, M Pedigree. Pick one. Uh, I'll take M Pedigree, which potentially can save about 700,000 lives in, okay. in Africa. That's a great answer. Yeah. All right. So, uh, and, I, and I think magnitude is very important. Uh, sustainability is very important along those lines. Um, what I'd like to do with some of our remaining time, um, I know that there are a number of people that are, that are passionate about ICT in the audience. I'm already seeing some hands. So if we could have our folks uh, with the, uh, the paddles come towards them. Um, please ask your questions to any of the audience. But I think, you know, there's no question that this is a, as we arrange that, this is a golden time um, where young people have an assumption that they're going to have access. Uh, people now 
do not question whether there should be a focus on ICT, but it's a question of how much and why is it not enough. Um, so, so we're, you know, what are the outcomes as we, as we ask these questions for the next five years? In the front here, I think, was the first question. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you very much. Two things made me stand up. Okay. Owusu. Counterfeit drugs. They kill more people than we know. And if there's any way we can have people who, like me, are from the uh, fountain pen generation. Anybody know what a fountain pen was like? Um, it would be a, a game changer for health services. Yes. So maybe if, you know, if we can have some more information about how we can have access to that, I think that would be a great lifesaver. And uh, Safia. We lose a lot of information about patients because patients' records are bulky. Many of the patients we treat are illiterate. They do not understand the importance of documents and, and file numbers. Uh, is there any way that we can have maybe a record of that patient's treatment on a mobile phone? Because most people have a mobile phone, and if the mother does not have one, Maybe some of her children would have, or the husband would have. And that would save us a lot of trouble, looking for the files and knowing what drugs that person has been given and, and so on. Yeah. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. So if you want to answer briefly, and we've just got only a little bit of time left. Thank you for that question. Definitely, if there is a mobile phone for an iCow, there will definitely be a, a mobile application for uh, humans. And those are the major industries I think Africa is going to work on, the health industry, education, tourism, um, um, and, and health. That, those are the applications that are being pushed right now. But it's a matter of, again, not just an entrepreneur coming up and to do that. It needs the uh, financial support that um, he's talked about in terms of VC, venture capital. And, and uh, Gabon is now uh, instrumentalizing this uh, uh, smart cities, so it's almost like a government public-private partnership because most of the hospitals, it depends, I'm not sure, in Gabon, but in, in their own, their government-owned hospitals, there are clinics, so it's a matter of connecting the expertise that are in the private uh, clinics as well as the government clinics. I'm sure somebody should be able to come up with an, with, uh, um, uh, with uh, apps uh, mobile apps for that because actually on the internet there is a lot of been innovation on the medicine sector on the health sector so it's a matter of translating it to be on the mobile sector i think the hope is soon to come i just want to add a, um, yeah. okay Mac, i want to add a point um there's an application being run in um in um in, um, in africa today called motec which is saving a lot of pregnant women from dying where it simply runs on a future phone where um as a pregnant mother, you are registered on the system, and you receive voice, voice SMS in your local language telling you about your next time to the, uh, to the clinic whilst you're pregnant and yeah. um, the medicines you have to take. So it is possible that, um, as Sophia said, an application for, to keep health record of, of humans, I mean, it's possible, it's very possible, but it's all got to do with money and uh, probably government intervention to make it, I mean, to make it possible. I, I think you raise a, a, a good point there that, and it is important in this world of smartphones, uh, the notion of simple text is just as important uh, perhaps for the transformation of lives and actually the, the, the program that that's based on is called Text for Baby, exactly. uh, conceived by an organization called Buxiva and, 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 and put forward by the United States. Maybe I have time if, uh, if, my, if the voice of God will give me one more question. Is there one more question in the room or are we done? One more question there, right, right here. And then we'll then we'll conclude. Yes, please make your question brief. Uh, have a okay. question mark at the end. Okay, d'accord. Alors, Adi. Uh, Monsieur Mukasa from the Sociology Department in the Omar Bongo University. Uh, just a while ago, the question that was posed, I don't think anybody answered it. And uh, in fact, I was going to ask the same question concerning the medicines and the different uh, applications that would be capable to save lives because, in fact, uh, there are many false medicines that are circulating in the markets. 
And so, Mr. Lee Chambani, perhaps uh, uh, you're the director of uh, the digital economy here in Gabon. Perhaps you could tell us something concerning uh, the intention of Gabon, uh, who are carrying out a lot of social reforms. Uh, perhaps uh, you could, uh, Mr. Lee Chambani, would be ready to develop and to uh, spread around uh, this application at the level of Gabon. And since Mr. Usu did not answer the question, perhaps uh, he could also ask us uh, how we could have that technology here in Gabon. Application of, of medicines to avoid counterfeit medicines, and how, I've got an answer for that actually in terms of what's already happening. But perhaps you could be very brief and, and talk about where that stands. Yes, very quickly, in terms of the uh, uh, Gabon village, uh, here it's a pilot uh, experiment that we're developing with an international group. We have taken into consideration uh, this uh, problem, in other words, the uh, Canam GS uh, card, and of course it will be directly integrated into the application, the F-Care, uh, which we're going to be developing and integrating and the question of uh, traceability and the uh, security of medicine is going to be included in that program. And all these different projects that I was talking about before in terms of involving the young people in Gabon is very important. And we're taking that into consideration in terms of our incubator programs. So in the next session, so we're going to be uh, organizing uh, different conferences at the university in order to uh, try to have this, the best uh, form and uh, somehow include those uh, small businesses in our incubators. Sorry we don't have time for, for more questions. I will, I will do an add-on to Armand's point, which is that uh, across uh, Africa, there are a number of incredible programs that allow SMS messaging to verify medicines in a, in a variety of powerful ways. Uh, and then uh, to the other question related to uh, medical records, um, I, was, I was honored to be part of a program in Rwanda in rural healthcare that created a, a uh, open source based electronic medical record system. And my last point for you to think about is, is that rather than requiring in, uh, people to have their own cell phones, it actually uh, allowed people that can't afford a cell phone to still have the continuity of care throughout clinics in rural parts of Rwanda. And that, that program has been successful and is being rolled out. I know there are other questions and other hands, but I've also been uh, uh, flagged down to, to do it. Uh, yeah, if you'd like to make, yes, I'll yeah, give uh, you the honor of making that last point. Go oh, ahead. okay, thank you. Yeah, um, to, to get, to implement um, or to roll out uh, the M pedigree innovation in any given country, the, the first step is for the government of uh, the country, say Gabon, or the equivalent of, yeah, under the government, um, within, within the government, um, the equivalent of, let's say, the FDA in the United States or the you know, Food and Drug um, Administration would have to sort of approve for that uh, innovation to be implemented. And it's a fairly simple process. But to get more information, um, you, you go to mpedigree.net. And um, yeah, that, you know, you, it would have, you would have um, access to all the information that is needed. And uh, to implement in a given country, the government has to approve it. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think um, we're, we're being forced to wrap. Um, but you know, I think the, the most important thing about, about this issue uh, is that this is just the, you know, the tip of the iceberg of, of the many things that are happening uh, in this space. Um, and obviously, whether it's the, the involvement of government in prioritization or the involvement of entrepreneurs in accelerating innovation um, or multinationals that are, that are uh, recognizing the importance of ICT and actually, whether they're diaspora or, or not, uh, returning the, 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 the technologies and capabilities back to the, to the continent. Um, I think it is safe to say that uh, we may be impatient, but we are optimistic uh, that these changes are, are coming and, and changing things uh, in a very important and tangible, uh, measurable way. So I'd like to uh, thank very much my panel for, for, for being here. And um, I think hopefully for today, this will just merely continue uh, or begin the discussion um, of the importance of this, uh, of this great topic. So uh, thank you very much.